Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Erol Cebeci, the director of SETA DC, and I would like to welcome to all of you. Today we will be discussing the latest SETA report on European perceptions on Turkey. And uh, the, this report was prepared by uh, Mr. Kuchukcan, who is sitting today on my right, and Yuge Kuchuk Kelesh, uh, who has helped the, the, the report uh, in, in the original form and who is not with us today. But instead, we have Emiliana Alassandri, uh, who is joining us, who is sitting on the far right, and as the discussant. Uh, this is this was this event was uh, announced a little bit late, and, and I appreciate you being over here. Now, for those of you who are meeting for the first time, both uh, Mr. Fisher Chan and, and uh, uh, Emiliano Alessandri are distinguished analysts on Turkey and Turkish foreign policy. Uh, I won't read their bios, but it is written on the the, the handout outside. Uh, but I will introduce them very briefly. Professor Kuchuk Jan is the Director of Foreign Policy Program at the uh, at SETA Ankara, and he also teaches at the Institution for the Middle East Studies at Marmara University, and he is also currently an advisor to the Higher Education Council of Turkey. Dr. Amiliano Alessandri is a Transatlantic Fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States, he works on Europe, Turkey, and a broader transatlantic talk issues. Uh, we are privileged to have them here to discuss basically how the Europeans may be thinking about Turkey and Turkish foreign policy. Uh, the, the report that you will see, and uh, the, the report talks about uh, the, the implication, the perceptions from different European countries regarding Turkey's uh, accession to the European Union, and uh, it, I will not go into the detail, but just give you a very short background. In the wake of most recent elections throughout the Europe, in France, in Greece, and, and, and uh, in other countries, this is a very timely discussion because, because Europe has been undergoing some truly, uh, uh, this, some changes that some might argue that will tremendously affect the future of Europe and the European Union. Since the global financial crisis of 2008, Europe has to deal with a variety of economic, political, and social changes. Now, whether the elections in France was just one single event where the, the uh, uh, ruling uh, party changed from right to left, and whether this will have some uh, effects, on the European Euro crisis and the European economic policies and enlargement of European Union and actually uh, what type of a European Union will be there a couple of years down the road. All of these questions are legitimate questions and from the Turkey's perspective, they are very important. Uh, none of these discussions is independent of Turkey, basically, how Europe uh, will re-envision itself and its future is intimately related to also what happens between, between Turkey and Europe and there are uh, opinions uh, respected by everybody that they will legitimately argue one way or, or another and most of these type of studies on the Turkish accession to the European Union were the studies that were done in Turkey measuring the, the willingness or the, 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 the hardship of the process and those kind of things. This is, as far as I know, is the first study that was done in different European countries and the data was collected. That was, that is measuring the feelings and the perceptions of Turkish accession to European Union. And uh, there are probably a lot of things uh, could be said on this one. But I will uh, stop over here, and I will ask Mr. Chukchan for a 20, uh, around a 20 minutes presentation of the study, and uh, Emiliano will discuss the, the, the uh, presentation, and we will open up for the questions. Again, I thank you very much for coming. Uh, Mr. Chukchan, please. Well, thank you, Aaron, for this nice and kind introduction. 
Uh, I would like to thank SETA for organizing this meeting and also thank you for coming over here. Um, as you see, the, the title of the report is <coughs> European Perceptions of Turkish Foreign Policy. Of course, when we are talking about Europe, we are not talking about a single Europe, but there are many Europes, let's say. Therefore, I would like to remind this fact to you that when we are talking about Europeans, uh, we are specifically talking about three countries that we have visited for the purpose of collecting data. This is Britain, Germany, and France, three leading countries and opinion shapers, let's say, in the European Union. Uh, therefore, when we are presenting the findings, uh, I hope you will keep this in mind that I am not trying to essentialize what Europe is or European perceptions are as far as Turkish foreign policy is concerned. This is just a reflection of some of the intellectuals, policymakers, and experts who study and observe Turkey. Uh, we have in interviewed more than uh, 30 people in those countries and asked them several questions regarding the dynamism and changes and transformation in the Turkish foreign policy and how it's perceived by Europe or Europeans. There were many questions uh, regarding Turkey's membership to the European Union and also Turkey's new activism in the Middle East, Turkish position towards uprising uh, in the Muslim countries, whether Turkey can become a model or whether Turkey can inspire them. So I'll try to summarize the findings and uh, uh, then we will open up the discussion. First of all, I think there is a consensus among many observers of Turkey that there is a change in Turkey that we are seeing today, especially in the last 10 to 15 years. In many areas, Turkey has been changing. Uh, what we call this emergence of a new Turkey. Uh, of course, here I'm not going to talk about domestic political changes in Turkey. In my mind, these are transformative, uh, but more I will focus on the foreign policy issues, especially after the Cold War, that Turkey has really reshaped its uh, foreign policy. During the Cold War, Turkey allied with NATO, with the Western powers, so it was not really uh, pursuing an independent, even semi-independent foreign policy in the region. Uh, and the Cold War mentality was the dominant uh, perception in Turkey, uh, and th therefore Turkish foreign policy makers or decision makers did not really uh, try to uh, strike a balance between Turkey's Western interests and Eastern borders or Middle Eastern borders. But what we see in the last 10 years, especially with the rise of AK Party, that Turkey has, to a large extent, changed that perception and uh, tried to introduce a number of initiatives which would bring Turkey much closer to the neighborhood countries or neighboring countries. And this has intensified some debates, both in the United States of America and also in Europe, but mostly here in the United States of America, as we have uh, seen by our observations and interviews in Europe, there is a different case and different picture or perception of Turkish foreign policy activism in the Middle East. So what the main question, the first question we posed to the uh, people that we have interviewed was whether Turkish foreign policy activism uh, is something new, something different from the past, and whether this activism is based on rational calculations or rational decision making of Turkey or more ideological leanings of the AK Party. And what we see uh, mainly from the uh, interviews is that uh, they see new activism and new dynamism in Turkish foreign policy. And they, the Europeans uh, agree that uh, the AK Party started a rational policy rather than an ideological orientation because as you would remember, as far as AK Party came to power, there was an expectation that the country would become much more Islamicized, the European Union inspirations will die away. But what we remember from the first statements of the party leaders and party uh, decision makers was that the, the commitment towards full membership of the European Union was reinstated and underlined. And I think this was well taken by the Europeans that uh, they were uh, in the beginning a little bit mistaken because they were not expecting that much commitment to the European values, European uh, Union membership. And it was acknowledged by the Europeans that Turkey has done a lot in terms of aligning its uh, rules and regulations uh, and legal structures uh, with the European Union. Many reform packages were passed by the Parliament 
And of course, it was not to the success of the party, it was also supported by the main opposition party. The Turkish parliament as a whole uh, continued this uh, commitment to become part of the European Union. But when there were different voices within the European Union, especially Germany and France, the public opinion in Turkey started to change. Despite this fact, what we see, especially up until 2005, the uh, current government really pushed uh, quite uh, intensively to uh, pass the reform packages through the parliament, and I think they have uh, achieved uh, success. Later on, this uh, something some people call it enlargement fatigue. Sometimes it's called uh, by the Turkish uh, politicians uh, that there was unwillingness uh, on the part of especially two European countries, France and uh, Germany, that Turkish public opinion started to dwindle uh, as far as its support to the European Union membership is concerned. But still, I think the Europe uh, is uh, on the board. When it comes to Turkey's foreign policy regarding the neighborhood region, especially this so-called uh, zero uh, problem with neighboring countries, uh, the first reaction came from the United States of America. There was an article at the time uh, was called Shift of Axis, and I cannot remember the full title, but title suggested that the West was losing Turkey, meaning that party was making ideological preferences uh, uh, as far as its foreign policy uh, concern towards Syria, towards uh, other Middle Eastern countries. Uh, so this was one of the questions that we posed to the people that we had interviewed, and we asked them whether this is an ideological orientation or reorientation of Turkish foreign policy on the basis of uh, Islamic uh, feelings uh, or Islamic roots of one party, or uh, it was a search for a balance, balancing act between East and West, and also it was a search for the security and also a uh, search for new um, uh, markets for the expanding Turkish economy. Uh, many people uh, that we have interviewed uh, were uh, not agreed with the dominant American view at the time that Turkish foreign policy was motivated by ideological grounds. Uh, when we look at the numbers, uh, they said, uh, and the statistics, especially economic uh, data, the decision making was based on rational calculation rather than ideology. It is acknowledged that ideology can play a role, or religious affiliation, history can play a role, and also, I think, played a role to some extent, but it was not the main uh, motivating factor. Maybe history, ideology, religion, uh, and the shared past uh, made uh, for Turkey easier to have access to the leadership of these countries and also to the markets, to the people uh, in the region. Uh, and uh, in the beginning of uh, 2000, the trade volume between Syria and Turkey was around 500 uh, million dollars. Uh, when the crisis started last year, the volume was around $2.5 billion and it was in favor of Turkey. And this is seen as a rational move by Turkey. And also, Turkey has a long uh, border this year, it's about 900 kilometers. And when you have uh, friendly relations uh, with a neighboring country, uh, one consequence is to have a secure border. And Turkey has a problem with the borders in uh, northern Iraq because of the Kurdish issue. And it was on the verge of a war with Syria up until 1999. Uh, so these, these movements were seen by the Western powers, Western intellectuals at least, as a net a rational move by Turkey, securing its borders and having access to the uh, large uh, market over there. Uh, the other, for example, data that uh, we have uh, to mention here is the trade volume between Turkey and the Gulf countries. Uh, when that party came to power, uh, in 2002, the trade volume between Gulf countries and Turkey was around 1.1 billion dollars. After 10 years, it's about 10 billion dollars. You can see the jump uh, in trade volume. So it is in the interest of all those countries because it is a kind of uh, creating an uh, interdependence in terms of economic uh, activities. I think that keeps many problems uh, lower because when you have this kind of uh, interdependency, the government uh, and policymakers should be much more rational when they are making uh, fundamental decisions. So this was another uh, argument by the Westerners. So in summary, the Turkish foreign policy, uh, though there were some uh, references time to time, were not really seen as uh, based on uh, religion and ideology, uh, though the contribution of religion and ideology is uh, uh, acknowledged. 
the decisions of Turkish uh, policymakers were seen much more uh, rational because they have argued that Britain, Germany, and France, if they were in the uh, same place like Turkey in such an environment, they would also uh, try to seek a balance between the Eastern and Western uh, alliances. Um, as far as uh, Turkey's European Union membership is concerned, this was another major point that we wanted to explore. Um, they acknowledged that Turkey has done a lot in terms of improving its own records, because uh, in the past, the main opposition to Turkish membership usually was based on following discourses. Turkey has a bad human rights records, it was the case. Turkish economy is failing. Uh, the inflation rate was much more than 100%. And also, Turkey has a young population. There is a lot of unemployment, so there will be a risk of a huge migration towards West. These were the main areas, uh, as acknowledged by the uh, respondents, that uh, the European Union was against Turkey's membership. But after Turkey improved its own records, especially on human rights issues, maybe not everything 100%, excellent at the moment, but there is a uh, significant improvement compared to the past. Uh, and Turkish economy is quite uh, strong and uh, dynamic. It's the uh, sixth or seventh biggest economy in the European Union and the 16th in the, in the world. And these were seen as positive developments in Turkey and also these, the, as I mentioned, the reform packages that Turkey uh, has passed over the years. Uh, when it comes to uh, the new uh, discourse in Europe, uh, they have labeled it, labeled it as a culturalist uh, discourse. Because especially uh, the Sarkozy of uh, France uh, and time to time some other European leaders made references to the cultural uh, characteristic or cultural identity of Turkey. And they said Turkey is a largely a Muslim uh, country, so Islam has no place in the Western civilization. These were the uh, arguments that used to come from some European intellectuals or policy makers as far as Turkey's EU membership is concerned. Now they see that there's a, a emergence of culturalist discourse against Turkey's membership uh, in Europe because other grounds are no longer there. Human rights grounds, yes, there are some problems, but uh, largely those issues uh, have been resolved, except the Kurdish issue, of course. But it was not seen as uh, the for policy issue, so it was not the main part of this uh, debate. But it was seen as a problem that uh, Turkey should uh, address to do something else. Uh, but despite this, uh, Turkey, Turkey's, I think, uh, search or Turkey's uh, commitment to the European Union membership is still, uh, still there. And uh, one of the uh, indications of this is the fact that the uh, new government has appointed a special minister for there's an EU minister who is responsible for the negotiation with the European Union. This is, I think, an indication that Turkey is still would like to be part of the uh, European Union, but as a full member, not as a special or privileged uh, member. Um, one other issue that we want to explore as far as Turkey's foreign policy is concerned, that is again regarding uh, the Middle Eastern uh, policy, whether Turkey could become some kind of model for the uh, for the Muslim countries or North uh, African countries who are going through uh, fundamental changes and uh, transformations as far as the uh, power uh, shifts are concerned. What we have seen is that they made a distinction between old Turkey and the new Turkey. Turkey of the 1950s and 60s or even 1980s were heavily dominated by uh, the military uh, influence and also there were a lot of instability in terms of uh, politics, economics, etc. But the new Turkey, as we see, when there is an economic stability, when you have uh, a conservative government who is not really fighting with democracy or fighting with secularism, uh, which could really strike a balance among all these contested issues. Uh, and also uh, a country uh, that is uh, uh, developing constantly and also uh, uh, contributing to the uh, development in other countries through different means, like overseas development of agency in Turkey has invested millions of dollars in, in poor countries that uh, is part of 
Turkey is, I think, involved in uh, regional uh, affairs as well. Uh, but of course, the discourse and the rhetoric that uh, are used by the Turkish politicians are very much uh, commented by the people that they have interviewed. Uh, they said that sometimes the comments by the leaders of Turkey are seen a little bit you know, like a big brother uh, typology. But this is not really seen uh, very positively by some Europeans. But on the other hand, when you look uh, at the ground, especially the uh, views that are coming and aired by, by, the, uh, by the Arab countries, what we see is that they are interested in Turkey uh, for several reasons when they are looking at Turkey, and because they are now uh, getting rid of the old order, uh, they need to establish a new order, and what will be the new order, what will be the color, shape, and principles of the new order. Uh, they can look at Europe. Uh, if they are really seeking for democracy and secularism, because Europe is much better than Turkey in many ways. But Europe doesn't have a population. Europe doesn't have any country in Europe, doesn't have a population of uh, uh, Turkey, and doesn't have a government like Turkey. In Turkey, there is a government which is supposed to be uh, Islamic oriented. And so this is how it is seen by, uh, by the uh, Arab world. But despite the fact that a conservative government with a large Muslim population in Turkey can achieve some success in terms of economic political stability and having an influence in the neighborhood, though Syria is the exception. That's a different case that we might discuss. Therefore, uh, for the Arab world, I think Turkey is uh, kind of uh, a source of inspiration, not necessarily model, of course. I mean, Turkey never used a concept of model, but uh, Turkey learned from Europe, and it is uh, not a shame for us. And we are proud that we have become part of uh, Europe for some time, and because of the Europeanization, because of the European Union aspirations, that Turkey was able to change its roles. Otherwise, it was going to be very difficult for Turkey to, for example, strike a balance between civilian powers and the military power. Today, in, in, last year, for example, there was a uh, change in the uh, constitution. More than 20, I think, four uh, articles were changed. All these efforts, I think, were somehow motivated by Turkey's aspiration to become part of the European Union. So learning from other countries, that's something that uh, you should be ashamed of. Therefore, I think many Arab intellectuals, many politicians of new generation are coming to Turkey, as far as I can see. They are talking to people, uh, civil society, industrialists, and politicians, uh, and they are trying to learn how Turkey has done this with the Muslim population, with the democracy, with the secularism, etc., etc. Uh, but what is important here is the language that the politicians uh, are using, I think. Uh, the Arab people, they don't want to see some big brother imposing a certain model on them. Rather, they would like to share uh, their uh, uh, experience. And one other question that uh, we wanted to explore was about Turkey's uh, ambitions, Turkey's foreign policy, and also Turkey's presence in many parts of the region. Uh, this was uh, critically uh, by many Europeans that we have uh, interviewed. They said Turkey uh, is a little bit more over-ambitious uh, sometimes. Sometimes it, it is over success. Turkey would like to be here and there. Turkey would like to resolve a number of questions uh, in the neighboring region, sometimes beyond the neighboring region. But Turkey should look at its own resources, whether Turkey has the resources, has the capacity. I think there is some truth in what they have said, because uh, Turkey is an emerging power in the region, but uh, one should distinguish between rhetoric and the, and the, and the real politics. In rhetoric, in maybe in an ideal world, uh, you would like to resolve all the problems, you become part of the conflict resolution. But when it comes to the resources that you are enjoying or you are having, I think Turkey has some limitations and uh, are recognizing this is a limitation. But of course, the, uh, when we are talking about Turkey, you have two kinds of audiences. One, domestic audience, and when the politicians talk to domestic audience, they have a different language and sometimes. Sometimes more, uh, more uh, idealistic. When it comes to talking to uh, outside, I think a real politics becomes much more important. Therefore, there is that view that Turkish foreign policy is over suppressed. But when you talk to Turkish politicians, they will say uh, that uh, if there are uh, crises and if there are new developments and changes in, in, in and around our region, we cannot really turn a blind eye. I think this is also a relevant argument uh, by the politicians. Um, 
So uh, there is one more question that, that I will address and then uh, finish my uh, summary of this report. We also talked about this question of neo-Ottomanism in the region, because both in the Arab media and also in the Western media, Turkey's involvement in the region is somehow uh, explained by this concept. Turkey has, uh, also the foreign minister, uh, has this concept of strategic debt. For him, strategic debt is, has geographical, political, and historical meaning, which uh, is underlined by the fact that uh, Many of those countries that Turkey is dealing with now uh, were part of the Ottoman Empire. When the Ottoman Empire was collapsed, 28 nation states were established, mainly on the, uh, on the Arab side. Uh, for him, as I said, all these kind of historical links uh, are a, a positive legacy that uh, we can make use of. But during the formation of the uh, national governments or nation states, what we know is that there was a homogenization policy and there was also identity construction based vis-a-vis -vis others. So the Arabs constructed their own identity vis-a-vis -vis Turkey and Turks and Turks established their own identity by blaming sometimes the Arabs. I think all these historical enmities and hostilities uh, <coughs> to a large extent resolved. And whether Turkey uh, pursues a new Ottomanist ideology for people that we have interviewed, at least, they don't see such an agenda. They say this is, as, as I say, a country emerging and looking for new markets in the region and also for some public influence. Uh, therefore, the question of neo ottomanism wasn't very relevant for the people that we have uh, interviewed. Um, so I will stop here now and then uh, leave to the chair. Uh, and we can maybe discuss other issues later. Uh, yeah, please, this is a study, as uh, Talib has said, that is done in Germany, France, and Britain, and practically 10 years of Turkish foreign policy and how they seen by the Europeans. You are one of those people in this city who knows uh, Europe, Turkey, and the United States. Uh, so uh, let's have uh, your opinions and your comments on the, the study and what uh, Talib has presented here. Sure, and <laughs> thank you, Errol, and thank you, Tarek, for the very kind uh, invitation, and congratulations on, on this uh, very valuable addition to the debate on, uh, on Turkey and Turkish foreign policy. And uh, I, have, I was part of a similar project uh, a few years ago that looked at European perceptions of Turkey EU membership, and a piece of it was on foreign policy. Uh, but this study, uh, focusing on foreign policy, I think is probably the first uh, that I have uh, seen. And even though uh, you only picked uh, three countries, I think you know the, your findings are uh, largely consistent with, with what we see in other countries and what we see in uh, European debates on Turkey more broadly. So I can add something, especially in the Q&A on the Italian perspective or, or, or other countries' perspective, but I think you cover pretty much uh, the debate at the European level. Um, I will try to uh, comment a little bit on the findings and then uh, move to an aspect that the report probably doesn't develop enough, which is you know, the, the influence of US debates on uh, European views uh, of Turkey. And then I will try to say something about where do we stand, um, where, where we stand right now in terms of policy cooperation. Uh, or political cooperation, not just perceptions uh, and views of each other. And I think you know one of the points that the the report makes is that Europeans overall have po positive views of Turkish foreign policy in the past ten years, and they remain largely favorable and supportive of, of what Turkey is trying to achieve. Uh, and this is largely correct. I mean, I will try to qualify a little bit towards the end, but this is largely the opinions that Europeans have. You also point out, again correctly so, that um, there is some uh, difference between uh, scholars, uh, intellectuals, and public opinion and policy makers. Uh, you basically say scholars tend to be uh, very supportive, uh, they understand the nuances, they understand the, the shades of grey, of uh, shades of colour, what Turkey is doing. Uh, public opinion can be sometimes more polarized, policy makers may have uh, some more doubts on specific issues. 
And again, this is correct, and I see uh, a difference from what you have in the U.S., where you have, uh, at least right now, policymakers who are you know, divided, but many of them are, um, uh, at this point in time, uh, supportive of what Turkey is doing. But you still have you know, a, a number of scholars who are, uh, for various reasons, and we can get into that, but they are very critical. You know, prejudice, uh, or they have a very strong ideological uh, stance. You don't, you don't have that, or you don't have that on the on, on a similar scale uh, in uh, in Europe. Moving to public opinion, I have to say, I mean, you know, I think public opinion in Europe simply doesn't know Turkey enough. I mean, I was part of a, of a research project that led to an opinion poll in Italy, which is supposed to be one of the countries that are. You know, more knowledgeable about Turkey and also more supportive of Turkey's aspiration as a European Union member. And uh, the findings were uh, very upsetting and shocking. I mean, and I looked at the, at the data we collected among, you know, educated people, less educated people. This was just a couple of years ago. And uh, a lot of people, not the majority uh, of, the, of, the, of the interview in, in, in Italy thought that Turkey is an Arab country. Uh, they think that Turkey, Turkish people speak Arabic. Uh, they, they think that uh, women are, uh, have enjoyed the same rights as women in Saudi Arabia. I mean, this is Italy. And I think you know, there's a lot of work that can be done uh, in terms of the quality of journalism coming uh, from, uh, from uh, Turkey. Uh, we now have some good journalists, but you know, we can do much better. I think tourism will help a lot, and, and probably you know the turmoil that the Arab uprising have brought to other areas of the Middle East, which is unfortunately a curse on, on them and their to, uh, touristic industry, uh, is already translating in greater flows to Turkey. And the more people go and see Turkey with their own eyes, the more they may uh, appreciate uh, the you know the, the complexity of, of that country. But you know overall, I think public opinion knows very little in two, last three of the countries that you have analyzed the experiences with the Turks uh, in their uh, own uh, country, in Germany, the community is there, I mean, in France, the community is there. And, and that, again, is uh, as if you know, Americans would judge Italians based on the Italian communities here in, in the US uh, after they migrated uh, in, in the last centuries. So it's a very limited, narrow and, and, uh, view, and sometimes misleading view of what the society, the culture, and the country is behind them. Um, moving to uh, policy makers and, and even scholars, uh, the, the view, as we were saying, is overall positive, uh, but it's still very superficial. And, and some of these debates that you have uh, interrogated them with, you know, the, the neo-Ottoman Turkey, Turkey as a model, Turkey shifting axis, this is more or less the way a lot of Europeans, including informed Europeans, look at Turkey. So they, they're always looking for a new characterization, um, a way you know, to, to capture the essence of this country. Uh, the bridge metaphor uh, is uh, often used, and you know, I have issues with that, and I will also try to explain why, but we can leave it for later. But you know, it's a very superficial view, and, and even if it's positive overall, it has not led to you know, uh, deep interest in the prospect for EU integration. So this is something that your report doesn't uh, develop uh, too much, but it's an interesting point. I mean, there is a generally positive view of what Turkey is doing and trying to achieve, but that doesn't translate immediately into renewed attention and focus on the issue of the future place of Turkey in the European Union. And here I have to say the the problems are many, but you know those who have opposed Turkey EU membership have always made this point, which is actually quite strong. I mean, the more Turkey proves that it's a strong regional power, especially in the Middle East, the more our point is is proved right that you know Turkey doesn't need to be a EU member, can be a regional leader. You know, why do we need such country into the EU? And those who favor accession uh, sometimes. Uh, in advertently have, uh, have uh, argued the same because they have said no we need Turkey because it's an asset it's a bridge uh, for Europe towards the Middle East but a, a bridge by definition has two pillars and, uh, and if one is in Europe the other one is outside Europe so it's again difficult to see it as a full incorporated member of, uh, of the uh, European Union and uh, 
And again, the ones in, in Europe who have supported the accession process have often said, well, you know, Turkey is, is a different country, uh, but uh, a country that can help us. But, you know, the very assumption that it's a different country because it's predominantly monthly uh, gives a lot of ammunition to those who are against for cultural reasons, civilizational reasons, domestic politics, uh, what have you. So, again, you know, it's, I think, an interesting point to know that this uh, overall positive view of Turkish foreign policy has not translated into more favorable views of uh, Turkey's future in the European Union. A few points on the U.S. influence, uh, which I think is very important you know, on, on uh, European debates. Uh, from a strictly diplomatic point of view, I think you know, the work that was done in the 1990s uh, by the Clinton administration was very important. And uh, before uh, Turkey even became a candidate country uh, for, uh, for a EU accession. And I think you know, there was a strong push from uh, the American side, uh, which backfired, but only to an extent. I remember a lot of uh, parties at the time in Europe saying, well, you know, it's again the, you know, uh, the UK again. You know, we, have, uh, we have a country that uh, whose future participation in the EU is pushed very much by the Americans. Uh, it's not about you know, uh, building a community, it's about becoming a more strategic oriented viewer, but at the same time enlarging our market. We don't really like that. But overall, I think uh, the influence was positive, at a strictly diplomatic point of view, and led to uh, important breakthrough, including the one at the end of the 1990s. Then, since the 2000s, the influence, I think, has been overall negative, very negative, because <clears throat> in the early 2000s, after 9 11, you had uh, on the one hand, people here in the U.S. saying, well, Turkey is a model. I mean, actually, the discussion about the Turkish model started then. And a lot of people said, well, Turkey is a model of a country that can live with democracy and predominantly Muslim society and can also be a country that is peaceful and doesn't have uh, extremism and all that. But you also had other people, very influential, including Samuel Huntington and others, who said, well, Turkey is a 